And so let's begin with um, some um, problems that have been solved through proper engineering in terms of polymer processing. So these are lists that we've worked on over the years. And, and uh, all these types of problems can be avoided by performing proper engineering on the equipment. And um, the benefits of good engineering were kind of summed up in this slide right here. Um, to identify a problem in engineering has a relative cost of a dollar. That problem, the cost of that problem increases tenfold when it's identified when you're in production. And then when it's a finished product or the customer finds it, the price, uh, the cost of that problem increases even higher. So uh, performing good engineering from the start is, um, is really beneficial as a, as a major cost savings. The uh, problems that we're going to discuss today in this presentation involve uh, gels or unmelts, and these are going to be unmelt showers in a, in a film sample, excessive screw wear and damage, excessive melt temperature variation, polymer degradation, and some co-extrusion instabilities. And finally, we're going to talk about slow and unstable profile extrusions. These are a variety of problems in extrusion that um, we're going to present today. The engineering work or the simulation work is performed using the CompuPlast Virtual Extrusion Laboratory suite of CAE tools. So the simulation results you see are from this software. So moving along to the first problem, uh, here's a sample of film with these uh, particles or People often refer to any defect in a film sample as gels, um, which isn't really correct. Gel should be reserved for a degraded or cross-linked um, polymer. In this particular case, the uh, gel, shell, uh, gel showers were actually unmelts in the product, and they were, they were observed by basically taking a sample of the product and, and testing it. Um, basically bringing it above the melting temperature of the polymer and watching these so-called gels disappear, indicating that they were unmelts. And this was a periodic problem that occurred um, after a few hours of operation, and then it would reappear, and then everything would settle down again. And whenever we see a periodic problem in extrusion, we tend to look toward the extruder uh, for this type of problem. And so we had them uh, pull out the extruder screw and inspect it. And as can be seen here, the, uh, the screw showed a noticeable discoloration in the uh, feed section and at the start of the compression region of the screw. And so uh, just to give a little background of one of the parameters that we look at, I'm going to use um, this slide and some information from a presentation we made back at Antec 2000 using a glass window extruder. So when the polymer uh, comes into the extruder, it comes in as a solid pellet, which gets compressed and then starts to melt as it moves along the screw. And it forms basically two phases. You have a melt phase and a solid phase. Uh, we can verify this using uh, video from a glass window extruder. And so here we can see the solid pellets coming in and forming what we call the solid bed and continuing on. And then a melt pool starting. Uh, it's not so clear in this slide. It's a little bit more clear here. On the, on the pushing flight, uh, there's a melt pool that seems to get wider while the solid bed gets narrower and narrower. And ultimately, the solid bed uh, completely melts and disappears. And this would be like a normal uh, extrusion, extrusion process. Now, in some cases, so here we can see, sorry, the, uh, the solid bed and the, the melt pool. The melt pool, uh, it looks like it's empty. But because of the polymer 
is amorphous. Uh, when it's molten, it's just clear. So you can see right to the root of the screw beside that flight. But you can see here, even in this short channel, how the solid bed gets narrower and narrower while the melt pool gets wider. And further down the screw in this particular experiment, we notice something a little different. We notice that the solid bed is discontinuous. So let's take a look at that a little closer. So here in, in this particular experiment that we did, we could see the discontinuity in the solid bed, which we refer to as solid bed breakup. And when the solid bed breaks up, what happens is the, uh, the solid material gets uh, encased in molten polymer and doesn't experience the necessary shear against the barrel surface to perform the proper melting. And so we have to rely on melting by conduction. As we can see here in this video from uh, Dr. Zhu's original experiments on a glass window extruder, these uh, grayish uh, areas are uh, solid bed material that is in the melt stream now and is, uh, is trying to melt by simple uh, heat conduction, which we know with polymers is, is very low. And so the material now coming out of this extruder uh, will go through the breaker plate. It'll break up into smaller particles. And because it hasn't properly homogenized or mixed with the bulk material, when it cools back down on the final product, it will have a slightly different density than the material around it. And it will appear um, as, a, as a gel, uh, which in fact is it's just an unmixed uh, particle, improperly homogenized prop, uh, particle. So um, we define a parameter that we, that we use called the solid bed ratio. And the solid bed ratio is basically the width of the channel relative to the solid bed along the channel. And um, as the melt pool gets wider, the solid bed gets narrower. And so the solid bed ratio is just the solid bed width divided by the channel width. And it's, a, um, it's an indication of the melting capability of the screw. So we use this parameter to uh, help us determine whether the particular screw design is, um, is correct for the material and the conditions that are, that are running. Now, on this particular screw, when we analyze the solid bed ratio along the screw, so here's the screw laid in to show you. Uh, this is the um, length of the screw from 0 to 1, relative length. And this is the relative amount of solid material in the screw. And as, as you can imagine, the start of the screw, we have completely um, solid material in the channel. So the entire channel is full of solid material. And at some point along the screw, that material starts to melt and create a melt pool. So the solid bed ratio starts to reduce. But you'll notice on this particular analysis, the solid bed ratio reduces to a point, approximately 50%. And then from this point onward, it starts to increase again. And it doesn't mean that the material is resolidifying. Um, you have to keep in mind that the solid bed ratio is a linear measurement, just the width of the solid bed, and doesn't consider the fact that the screw root, the screw root diameter is increasing as we get into the compression session. So at this point, the material starts to get squeezed by the um, increase in root diameter. And if the squeezing rate is faster than the rate of melting, the solid bed will spread and get wider. And as you can see from the analysis here, the solid bed goes back to one, which begs the question, what happened to the uh, melt that was there? Now, this is a bit of an anomaly, but you have to keep in mind that we're using a steady state simulation to simulate a non-steady condition because the, the gel particles were um, were transient. They were happening every couple of hours. So what happens is the material, the solid bit gets wedged in this section, 
and basically it just spins while the material that had previously melted continues to get pumped along at the end of the screw here. And then once it gets hot enough, it breaks away, forms the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the solid bed breakup. You get the solid bed breakup. That material, of course, doesn't melt as properly and appears as a defect in the product. And then the whole process starts again. So whenever we see a situation like this in the simulation analysis, we understand that this represents poor melting condition. Once this is understood, then we simply modify the process conditions, change the material, or optimize the screw design to achieve better melting performance on the screw so that our solid bed ratio continuously reduces and goes to zero prior to the end of the screw, so uh, gives the material time to homogenize um, and, uh, and give you a better quality melt. So we want to see a solid bed ratio result in our analysis that looks more like this, and this is a result of good melting. Um, the next um, problem I'd like to discuss is excessive screw wear and even damage. And so some examples here, this is um, uh, the precursor to wear. It's a discoloration due to a high surface stress. Um, <clears throat> a lot of people believe that the discoloration is a result of excessive heat, but you need a very, very high temperature to uh, turn a chrome screw blue. Um, this was done due to stress, and uh, the this region right here is the end of a grooved section in a, a particular extruder. And um, the other way you can conclude that this was done by stress and not heat is by the rather abrupt change in color. Since metal is a good conductor, it's unlikely that the temperature would change so abruptly in such a short region. So the high stress created by the groove feed section uh, discolors this screw surface. And this can have, um, uh, this high stress and high pressure that's created uh, can have um, effects, detrimental effects on the screw life. So here you can see uh, a screw, this is toward the end of a, of a, um, a barrier section, or a groove feed section. You can see here that there's a definite flight width. Here it gets narrower, and here it's essentially an, a knife edge. So the, the polymer pellets, due to the high force, have actually worn away uh, the, uh, the flight of the screw. And here we can see the surface damage that after a high stress uh, discolors the screw, the, the stress of the pellets on the screw surface actually uh, pull off the chrome layer and you can see the um, metal underneath that has been exposed. So this is a result of, of very high forces on the extruder screw. Now an extreme case here is catastrophic failure of uh, 150 millimeter or 6 inch screw shown here where it actually broke into two pieces. And so um, we analyzed this system, again, using what we refer to as the solid bed ratio, and um, to, to understand why we would have this catastrophic failure. Now this result uh, shows the solid bed ratio in black, corresponding to the axis on the left, and the blue line represents the relative unmelted amount of material corresponding to the axis on the right. And if you recall, I said the solid bed ratio simply is a ratio of the width of the solid bed in the channel and doesn't consider the compression of the, um, of the root depth. Whereas the unmelted amount is a volume measurement, it tells you how much material still remains to be melted. And if we look at this particular result here, the um, solids channel depth reduces and the uh, wedge force of the solid material causes the screw 
to deflect because you can see we have at this point near the edge of the screw we still have quite a significant amount of unmelted material or, or solids left in the channel. Now typically this results in normal flight and barrel wear but in this case the channel depth reduction was very abrupt. You can see here right at the end uh, they have a very abrupt change in the geometry and there was still about 30 percent unmelted material which results in excessive unbalanced force and excessive periodic screw deflection and this leads to what we call cyclic fatigue failure and if we uh, calculate the number of cycles at 75 rpm 60 minutes 24 hours uh, 360, 365 days we get over 39 million cycles per year. And once you get into the millions of cycles, you start to experience this uh, fatigue failure in, uh, in metal. And this particular screw was failing after about um, 11 months. And it wasn't just one screw. It was a couple of screws that had failed uh, under the exact same um, uh, uh, mechanism. So here you can see the wear due to excessive lateral force from the wedging action of the screw. You can see the excessive wear. First, the flight was worn off, and then the screw root continued to wear. Now, normally, um, uh, so, so here is just a, a test that was done with an indicator put on the barrel of the extruder that was showing the problem. And you can see from the motion that range is about half a millimeter or 20 thousandths of an inch. So you can see from the rotation that the force was high enough to actually vibrate the barrel in this particular case. So normally in the screw, the screw is centered to the barrel and you have uh, the, the a melt pool on the flight that keeps everything uh, centered and uh, this is the, the, the way we would like to operate. But in this case, we had the uh, screw being wedged off to one side, and so we would get this oscillation. And very simply speaking, this is basically what we call the coat hanger effect, where you have many millions of cycles of the screw going back and forth, and ultimately the screw fails. So. Um, the correlation here to the problem is that once we see this type of simulation result on this particular screw design, we know that we're going to see this type of problem on the screw. And so uh, future screws, or anytime we make a new screw, we would analyze the performance and make sure that we have gradual compression of the solid bed through optimized screw geometry, and we want less abrupt geometry changes to ensure that, and then we could avoid um, the uh, failure, catastrophic failure, and even maximize the life of the screw before needing a rebuild. So this would be considered an acceptable simulation result, and we could proceed with the manufacturing of this design. The next item I would like to talk about is excessive melt temperature variation. And this is a, a very large problem in the extrusion industry. Uh, there are um, probably uh, most of our consulting work somehow deals in the area of uh, melt temperature, melt temperature variation, and, and poor understanding of the melt temperature. And I'm going to uh, explain this with a uh, comparison of two polymers, a 1MI low-density polyethylene versus a 1MI linear low-density polyethylene. And basically, uh, I'm going to explain uh, what happened when linear low-density was introduced in the late 70s. Uh, because we use um, melt index to characterize the polymer, you can see by the graph of the viscosity that uh, while both these polymers have the same melt index, the melt index is measured at a relatively low shear rate range between uh, 10 to the 0, which is 1, and 10 to the 1, uh, which is 10. So between 
one and 10 reciprocal seconds, we're measuring the melt index. And uh, unfortunately, the processing conditions are typically at higher shear rate ranges, somewhere between 10 and 1,000. And you can see from the graph that while these two materials, the 1MI linear low and the 1MI low density, have the same melt index measured at a low shear rate, when you get into the processing range of, let's say, 100 reciprocal seconds, the viscosity curves uh, diverge, and you can have a viscosity difference that is um, almost three times or greater. And as a result, if you were running this 1MI low density in your um, equipment, and let's say you had a head pressure of uh, two or 3,000 PSI, if you tried to process the 1MI linear low density in the same screw at the same rate, you would have pressures of six to 9,000 PSI and the corresponding increase in power draw and load, which many extruders did not have. Um, and so this would cause uh, problems in, um, in the process. Now, uh, supposing you could run um, the, uh, the screw, uh, we see the effect of this viscosity difference uh, on, we're going to use this particular screw design. This is just a generic um, uh, compression screw designed for LDPE. So it has a, uh, a 0.58 inch feed section and then a, a 200 thou a feed metering section. And um, we run a, an analysis of this particular screw and we can monitor the solid bed width, that's the black line, and we can see that the solid bed ratio is reducing and does reduce to zero prior to the end of the screw. And the blue line represents the bulk melt temperature in the melt pool over here. And we can see that once the material starts to melt, the temperature gets up to the melting point of 140, 150 degrees Celsius. And then gradually as the material is sheared and the barrel temperatures are adjusted, the bulk melt temperature increases and at the exit of the screw running at 75 RPM, we have a bulk melt temperature of 208 degrees Celsius, which is quite acceptable for um, low density polyethylene. However, just the bulk temperature isn't enough to ensure quality extrusion we want to have a very low temperature variation in the melt because polymer coming out of the extruder rarely has uh, one temperature. So this graph here shows the final melt temperature variation and the graph represents the gap at the end of the screw. So um, this is the temperature variation through the metering section gap. And this point right here with a little dot is represents a maximum temperature of 212 degrees Celsius. So we have a bulk average temperature of 208 and a maximum temperature of 212 degrees Celsius. And that four degree variation is relatively small. So we can see that this screw is quite acceptable for processing this 1MI LDP at 75 RPM. Now, we take that same screw and we introduce a 1MI linear low density polyethylene. Now with a 1MI linear low density, we get a little bit higher output rate uh, because the material pumps a little better, it's, it's more viscous. But if we look particularly at the melt temperature, we can see that the bulk average melt temperature at the end of the screw has increased by over 30 degrees Celsius, so it's predicting 239 degrees Celsius. And if we look at the temperature variation within the gap at the end of the screw, we'll see that the software predicts a maximum temperature appearing uh, somewhere in the middle of the channel of 253 degrees Celsius. So we have a much larger temperature variation in the system. But most processors are unaware of this temperature variation because if we consider the melt in the adapter flowing from the extruder to the die, we'll have 
a uh, gradient, a temperature variation in the melt stream, we'll hold the adapter, say, at 200 degrees Celsius, and we'll have a standard 3 millimeter, 1 8 inch melt immersion probe measuring our temperature at some point in the stream. And let's say that's giving us a temperature of 215 degrees Celsius. And we might be happy to process along under these conditions, except that in the center of the melt stream, we might have as high a temperature as 250 degrees Celsius, which means that we're going to have a very large temperature variation going into our dye, and this will certainly affect how our dye works and our final product quality. And so uh, unless you have a variable depth, depth melt probe where you can probe into the center of the adapter to see this, it is, it is very difficult to, uh, to, to find this type of problem. But yet it's a very, very common problem in the industry. And of course, the solution to that would be to optimize the screw design for the particular polymer that you're processing. Uh, the next item that I'd like to talk about is polymer degradation. And again, we're going back to the extruder. And typically, when you uh, buy an extruder, you might have a breaker plate in here at this point at the end of the screw. And um, you'll get tired of opening the system up to change screen packs on the breaker plate. And so many people install a screen changer, generally a, a hydraulic or manual screen changer. And these screen changers require some distance uh, prior to the breaker plate to uh, activate this um, uh, seal arrangement to prevent leakage. And so we end up having the uh, large area created from the screw tip to the breaker plate. And as well, um, some people will avoid uh, putting anything after the screen changer um, so that if they wanted to pull the screw out, they don't have to disassemble the screen changer or pull it off the machine. They can just index without a breaker plate, and then the screw can be pulled out through the screen changer. However, this creates these large volumes or large flow channels. And if you do a simple calculation, uh, assuming a 3.5 inch or 90 millimeter screw and uh, 250 kilos or 500 pounds an hour of low density polyethylene, you'll find that the shear rates uh, are very low in these channels. And more importantly, the shear stress is very low here. I have calculated a value of 5 kilopascals. So just to explain kind of what this means, uh, let me use uh, this example here of uh, the flow of a polymer in a flow channel. And we have basically a velocity profile that's parabolic, as shown here. And the shear stress is simply the viscosity times the shear rate in the channel. And the shear rate is always higher at the wall and lower in the center. So if we plot the shear stress in this channel, we'll see that the shear stress is zero, where the velocity is maximum. And the shear stress is maximum at the wall. And this shear stress at the wall is very significant because the shear stress needs to be high enough to scrub the wall clean. If we don't have a, a significantly or sufficiently high shear stress on the wall, what will happen is you will get a layer of polymer building up on the surface, which will essentially be stagnant. And that polymer will have a very long residence time and ultimately will degrade. And then it could pick off and, and come out into your product as a gel um, and some discolored, as some discolored material. Now, the question is, what is high enough? And I'll explain how we, how we get these values. But for now, um, I'll let you know that what we found through our experience is that most polyolefins need a shear stress of about 30 kilopascals on the surface to keep them self-cleaning or self-scrubbing, while materials like PVC, which is a little bit more sensitive, might need a little bit higher shear stress um, to, uh, 
to keep them keep them clean or keep the surface clean and avoid stagnation of the material. So um, the first thing we should do when we add a screen changer to our system is make sure we extend the screw tip to the breaker plate. And basically, you want to have about an eighth of an inch clearance per inch of screw diameter. So like a four and a half inch screw, you'd want about half inches away from the screen pack. And then on the other side, we want to reduce the diameter. So we put a bushing in to reduce the diameter uh, so that we can pick up the shear rate and more importantly, the shear stress in this flow channel. And this particular area, uh, often has a lot of discussion in it. Um, here's an example of how somebody felt that they should do this transition. This is a sample of polymer that's been pulled out of a transition from a 6 inch or 150 millimeter uh, extruder. So the breaker plate was over here and transitioning down to about um, a 45 millimeter or one and three quarter inch adapter. And you can see uh, here the degradation. This is uh, flexible PVC used for uh, uh, some uh, stationary and, and, and that sort of stuff. So you can see the degradation of the material here um, in this black charred region. So uh, this can be analyzed relatively easily using a, a 2D final element analysis because the flow field is actually symmetric. And so we did this. And this is sh showing the result of the simulation. Once again, this is the axis of symmetry. This is the inlet uh, that represents half of the six inch uh, inlet. And this is half of the one and three quarter inch exit. And the colors that you see on this image represent the shear stress in the flow field. And more importantly, what we're concerned about is the shear stress along the wall. And if we make a graph of the shear stress along the wall, we'll see that the shear stress here uh, at this uh, small diameter is, is high. But then as we get to a larger diameter, the shear stress reduces. And then it increases a little bit here at this point because coming out of the breaker plate, the holes in the breaker plate give us more of a, a plug flow type condition. So we have a relatively high uh, a flow uh, at the edges here, but that material starts to move in toward the center as the flow becomes more parabolic. So you can see that there's a region here that has a shear stress that is below the critical value. So here this line represents the critical value, and it coincides very nicely with the region where the polymer doesn't want to flow and essentially sits there and burns and, and stagnates. Now this particular uh, company suffered with this problem for well over a year and um, they had to basically stop their production line uh, every six hours. So six hours into the shift, they had to stop, open up this area and remove the material that was resulting in a black line on their on their product, and then clean it up and start up again. Once you understand where the problem is coming from, and what you need to do to avoid it, you want to maintain a high enough shear stress. Then you can analyze a variety of geometries. So here we've shown that the solution is actually quite opposite to what they were using. That by changing the shape of the transition out of the breaker plate so that the transition is a little bit more abrupt, you can ensure that the shear stress along this wall maintains above the critical value that you want and then avoid any uh, degradation or stagnation on the surface. So keeping the shear stress above the critical value uh, is essential to keeping those uh, surfaces clean. And as such, the bushing needs to be optimized uh, to solve this problem. Now, how do we determine what the critical shear stress is? Well, here's an example of a flat die that has shown some pitting near the edge or at the, the sides of the, of the manifold 
Um, this is a die used to produce uh, vinyl siding. And there's quite an industry uh, around refurbishing or um, replating and, uh, and, and cleaning up this pitting that occurs in these channels. And you can see that uh, the polymer, when it comes in from here and then starts to spread sideways, so that some goes to the left and some goes to the right, um, we, we, we have relatively clean channel with no um, uh, damage to the surface up until about this point where the PVC starts to degrade and form a corrosive byproduct. And the chrome plating isn't continuous. It has micro cracks. So the um, corrosive material gets under the chrome and starts to etch the base metal of the die. And as a result, you get the pitting that, that you can see here. Now, um, when we analyze this type of geometry, and here we show the result of a, a 3D finite element simulation, we can uh, plot the shear stress along the surface. That's what these colors are, red being high and, and blue being low. And we can see the low shear stress uh, resulting from an improper channel design or channel size uh, near the edge of the of the die. Now, uh, this is how we can determine what our critical shear stress is for our for our material. We know from uh, taking the equipment apart that our pitting starts, say, right somewhere right here. Let's let's call that uh, three inches or four inches from the edge of the die. We perform an analysis running the same conditions that the die was running under, and we uh, basically take the analysis results and move back to the same point in the analysis and measure or pick off the shear stress value at that point. So let's call that shear stress value 32 uh, kilopascals. Then any new die that we uh, order or, or get manufactured, we will ask the manufacturer of that die to ensure that all flow channels in the die have a surface shear stress above the critical value that we found, and then our future dies will run longer before they have any um, uh, degradation or, or buildup of material and require cleaning. So uh, ensuring that we have adequate shear stress in all flow channels is um, the, the main way to avoid polymer degradation. And this means proper channel design, but also proper operating conditions. Because if a channel is designed with the proper shear stress at, say, uh, 500 pounds an hour, and you're operating it at 200 or 300 pounds an hour, the shear stress will certainly be lower. Or if your melt temperature, you've changed the polymer and your melt temperature is higher, as we saw with the extruder example, then again, your shear stress can also be lower and you're back to the problem. So we want to ensure adequate shear stress on the walls of all the channels so that they can be self-wiping or, um, or cleaning. The next example I want to discuss is a, a slow and unstable profile extrusion process. And uh, for this, I'm going to use a automotive uh, profile um, because automotive profile dies typically have a relatively long development time and cost because they're done through trial and error. This ends up with high scrap rates, and um, they also end up with unstable production. The die uh, always goes uh, in and out of spec. So here's the uh, example that I'm going to use. This is a uh, basically a window profile automotive seal type die, and we have one material here, a, a relatively hard uh, polymer in here, and we have a softer polymer out over here. And this section in here is a moving metal support, often uh, used in these dies to help uh, maintain stability in the, in the product. Now, um, this is the uh, flow field of the die, the two materials, material one uh, in here, and then the other material 
coming out through these channels to, uh, to fill in the other area of the dye. And if we analyze the velocity distribution of the uh, material flowing in these dyes, uh, these lines here that you see represent the path of the material. And you'll see it as we progress through a series of cuts in the, in the geometry. So uh, here's a, a cut relatively um, a back in the uh, dye profile. You can see that the, the dye shape doesn't look much like the final shape of the, of the part. But you'll notice these high velocity regions and a fairly non non uniform velocity uh, through the uh, through the flow field. So as the material moves along, um, you can see here that actually move back one. Um, you can see here that the material starts to flow higher in these range areas, still relatively low. And then here, just before um, we connect the the material, just starts to touch the substrate or the, the moving metal section, um, we have the flow in these uh, sections right in here that's relatively high. So we have relatively high flow in here. And then just one little step further where we have the, the material touching the metal carrier, the carrier pulls the polymer away from these areas. So if you notice uh, these areas right in here, up to here, there's polymer flowing into them. Uh, everything is, uh, is, uh, appears to be fine. But then the moment the, the material touches the moving uh, metal carrier, that gets dragged out of there, and the material flows on the, on the metal surface. So these sections, in fact, uh, get starved. And so here, getting to the, to the exit, you can see the variation in velocity uh, of the material coming out of this particular uh, this particular die. So here we can see it closer. You can see here the uh, the flow in these in these channels is uh, there could be quite acceptable. But then the moment that material uh, touches the moving carrier and the carrier drags the material along, that actually pulls the material out of this section, leaving these areas. To be uh, to be starved. This is the uh, uh, material two region. You can see the velocity differences in, in um, um, throughout the die, ranging from 37 millimeters per second in here to 487 millimeters per second in this region, and over a thousand millimeters per second in here. All this material, when it comes out of the die, can only go at one speed. That's the speed of this carrier that's, that's pulling everything. And so there's tremendous velocity rearrangement when the material comes out of the die, leading to a thickness variation in the part and not achieving the thicknesses that you want. Also, uh, based on the flows and the distribution of the material uh, and the length of the channels, you can get a significant amount of viscous or shear heating happening in the die. And you can see these uh, the materials coming in at 80 degrees Celsius. And you can see that the red area here represents 138 degrees Celsius. And this yellowish area represents 104 degrees Celsius. So we have a very, very large temperature variation created in the in the material, which uh, the high heat can lead to um, premature crosslinking of this uh, it's, a, it's a rubber type material um, and and degradation of the material within the dye because this will certainly heat up the dye surfaces and and cause the material to uh, be hotter in various regions of this dye. So. Um, also, another factor that's very, very important in um, dye design is the elongation of the material or, or rapid changes in the velocity. This graph shows the elongation um, deformation rate um, along a path line. So here's the path line coming in 
for this particular polymer, and uh, everything is fine until it gets this region where the material has to accelerate. And you can see that the uh, deformation rate goes from 212 up to 1,240, and then back down to about 400 reciprocal seconds. This tremendous acceleration is uh, basically like stretching the material very, very quickly. And whenever you have a die with very high elongation rates, um, that, that forces very high elongation rates on the polymer, this makes the dye very, very sensitive to small changes in the material characteristics that the resin companies uh, have uh, a lot of difficulty in controlling. The, the resin companies um, are unable to control the elongation of viscosity very well. So uh, any time they have maybe some lot-to-lot -lot variations, that material will behave differently in the same dye even though its shear viscosity may be the same, um, because it responds differently to the amount of extensional deformation that it has to undergo. So uh, having these types of, um, of uh, forcing the polymer to do these uh, levels of velocity change um, is, uh, is uh, not really um, beneficial to the design and causes a lot of the problems that we see in the industry. So the solutions then are to have the flow channels engineered properly so that you have the right distribution of the polymer as is required by the final part. We want to minimize cross flows. Cross flows is what we use to um, uh, describe a polymer that has to flow from one side of the die to the other in order to get the distribution. And this is typically this typically occurs when, when dies are balanced uh, near the entrance manually through trial and error process. We want to avoid excessive shear heating in the die uh, by keeping any, any uh, high shear areas relatively short and avoiding any small channels, which are often used to try to correct flow distribution. And we want to avoid high elongation rates in the die uh, by avoiding any abrupt transitions and this will make the dyes less sensitive to differences in the polymer that may result from, from lot to lot in production. Now, in this particular case, this customer um, began by using proper engineering and applying uh, this type of, um, uh, these types of solutions to their designs. They began by saving uh, over $250,000 per year and by reducing the development time of their dyes and increasing their production rates, they actually increased the number of dyes they could make in a year by over 200%. So performing proper engineering on the equipment can, can really make a big difference to the bottom line of any company. Now finally, the last item I want to talk was unstable co-extrusion processes. Um, here is a sample of film that shows this wave pattern in it, and this wave instability um, uh, has been observed in uh, various types of applications, in, in blown film co-extrusion, in cast film co-extrusion. In this case, I'm going to uh, discuss it um, in uh, relation to cast film extrusion, and here is the film sample that uh, this customer wanted to produce, the three-layer structure, which had a two thick, two thick layers and a relatively thin uh, core layer. And they were using feed block co-extrusion on a flat die, and they would combine the three materials in a feed block and then extrude them together into a flat die. And they were observing this wave instability in the, uh, in the product. If we take a cross-section of this feed block and analyze how the layers come together, we can see this result here, which is basically the velocity of the polymers in this flow channel. And if we look at the uh, numbers, the details here, we can see that uh, because of the way they had set up these lamellas, they had a, a very high speed area right in here of 113 millimeters per second. 
and the core layer was coming in at a maximum velocity of about 15 millimeters per second. And then when the materials came together and entered the back of the flat die for distributing, uh, they ended up with a maximum velocity of 65 millimeters per second. So if we consider the extension or elongation of the core material, it basically had to accelerate by 4.4 times in this region. So another way to look at that is to look at the shape that that core material occupies, the space it occupies, and you can, you can kind of imagine here how this material gets drawn by the other materials when it, when it merges with them, and you can see how it stretches down to become thinner from this original thickness over here. So the material is experiencing very high elongation, acceleration, and whenever we say high acceleration, we mean elongation. And so let's take a look at a characteristic of the polymer that I, I talked about in the previous example also, and that's the extensional or elongational viscosity. And uh, this graph is showing and comparing uh, the elongational viscosity versus the elongation rate. So similar to shear viscosity and shear rate, but now under, under conditions of stretching. And materials like high density or linear low density polyethylene that have relatively short chain branching and linear molecules tend to have what we refer to as a strain softening behavior. You can see the as you stretch them, so this, this line represents stretching rate. As you stretch them, they become easier to stretch. But certain polymers have what we refer to as a strain hardening behavior. And these are polymers like low density polyethylene or EVOH, which are highly branched, have a lot of entanglements. When you start to stretch the polymers, the entanglements resist the stretching, and you end up getting a strain hardening effect until ultimately you break the uh, material. So it's just like taking some chewing gum and stretching it quickly and, and breaking it. Um, until you break the material, and then that starts to um, start to reduce down again. Now, it so happened that in this particular problem, the core material had a very, very high elongational viscosity. It didn't like to stretch. And um, if we look at the elongation rate and the, and the velocity, this, this graph shows the velocity on the scale on the left, which is the black line and the elongation rate on the scale on the right, which is the blue line. And we can see that uh, the velocity is going along at uh, its, uh, whatever, 15 millimeters per second. And then just at the merge region, the material slows down a little bit due to the taper in the channel. And then it accelerates up to 64, 65 millimeters per second, entering the, the flat die. Correspondingly, the elongation rate here shows uh, flat, essentially zero elongation prior to the merge region. Then when the material slows down, that's like compressing it or squeezing it together. And then there's a rapid acceleration of the material or stretching of the material, resulting in an overall extension rate of 4.5 reciprocal seconds. Now, this is a number that has no meaning to us, really unless we correlate it to an observed problem like they had in this situation. And so we know that this is uh, causing a problem, and so 4.5 is bad in this case. And we want to do something to reduce the amount of elongation that the material experiences in that process. And our only option here, really, is to modify the geometry of the feedblock. So you can see here that in this core layer, the channel has been modified to pre-accelerate the material so that it's going faster prior to the merge region. And as a result, so you can see all the velocities are a little better balanced out. And we've accelerated this, essentially doubled the speed to about 26 millimeters per second. The speed going into the die will be exactly the same because we, we're using the same geometry and the same flow rate. But because we've pre-accelerated the material, the acceleration ratio is reduced almost in half. So we're down to 2.5 acceleration ratio. We can look at the space the layer occupies, 
And even here, you can see there's less deformation on that material. Once it merges, it doesn't stretch as much in this, in this region. And if we look at the graphs of velocity and elongation rate, you can see where the velocity is pre-accelerated. And here we can do that at a controlled rate by defining what taper we want to put on that channel to increase the velocity. So we can do that at a controlled rate to give us a low elongation rate. And now when the material is moving faster, when it gets accelerated after they merge together, that elongation rate is also um, reduced. So now we have a total uh, elongation jump that is about 2.5 reciprocal seconds, again, about half of what it was um, originally. And this helps to solve the problem and uh, uh, avoids the wave instability that was observed in the product. Now, a similar situation can happen in uh, tube uh, or tube coating or, or cable jacketing. Here's an example of a cable with the wave problem showing on the surface. Uh, so this, the, when they put this coating on there, they observed these waves. And here you can see the waves in here on the surface coating, and they wanted to get rid of them. The original merge region was designed like this. This is the top layer. This is the um, uh, bottom layer. So these two layers then are coated on top of this initial flow stream. And um, when they were extruding these systems, they saw, in this case, a severe deceleration of the material. So you can see here that the elongation rate was minus 125 coming from this channel into this channel in here. And um, they observed the problem. The solution was, again, to change the amount of deformation the material was experiencing when it was merging. So you can see they uh, adjusted the channel so that it merged uh, more on an angle. And they changed the gap. You can see the gap is much larger to slow down the material here because it's going to be going slower in here based on its viscosity differences and, and so forth. So they corrected the merge region to uh, uh, reduce the amount of deformation the material was experiencing. And as a result, they could produce a product without the wave instability that they were observing originally. So uh, when you have an unstable co-extrusion process, uh, the solution is to avoid formation of excessive elongation stress or deformation during the merging of the individual layers. And uh, by performing the analysis, the engineering analysis, we get the velocity of each layer in a multi-layer flow field and then adjust the channels, engineer them properly, so that the pre-merge velocity more closely matches the post-merge velocity, and so you avoid any high acceleration or deceleration. So uh, in conclusion, process engineering solution um, simulation, sorry, process engineering simulation provides more information for correlation of material properties, geometry, and process conditions with particular production problems so we can understand the problems better. Once we have the um, simulation, then we can uh, lead to faster and more precise solutions to the problems, or by performing proper engineering, we can avoid the problems altogether. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, if you have any questions, you can uh, type them here in the chat window and um, we will read them out and try to answer them to you. Or you are welcome to uh, contact me. You can send me an email here at jp at .net, or give us a call, and we can try to uh, <clears throat> answer any questions that you may have. Also, I'd like to make you aware that uh, this fall we will be having a extrusion engineering and troubleshooting seminar September 9th to 11th in uh, Williamsville, New York, near Buffalo, New York. And more details about this event can be found at this website, uh, compuplast.biz, B-I-Z, slash seminars1. Or you can send us an email at seminars at compuplast.com, and we would be pleased to uh, provide you with more information about this event.
So with that, uh, thank you very much. And uh, I'll take a look to see if there are any questions in the chat window.